We know electric cars are becoming more popular in Australia. By now, you've probably seen or at least read about the increasing number of models on sale. But there are some lingering concerns about battery electric cars, and primarily for Australians, that comes down to the limited range, long charging times, and high upfront cost. It's a good thing then that the future holds an alternative, and two of Australia's biggest brands are working on making it a reality. The technology is hydrogen fuel cell, and in this world first test, we'll be sticking the two models available in Australia head to head in a scenario that will be familiar for many work and family travelers. First of all, we're gonna meet our two competitors, but before we do, remember to check out the full written content over on carsguide.com.au. And if you are watching on YouTube and are enjoying our videos so far, remember to hit like, subscribe, and the bell notification icon just to stay up to date with all of our latest content. Our first competitor is the Hyundai Nexo. The Nexo is a mid-size SUV which has been around for three years internationally, but was only made available to Australians this year. Our next competitor is the second generation Toyota Mirai. Unlike the first generation which looked a lot like a Toyota Prius, the new Mirai is more of a statement, looking and feeling like an executive sedan as opposed to the traditional SUV shape of the Nexo. We started our test here in the ACT for a reason. This station behind us run by AGL is one of only a handful in the country right now, but it's one that can fill our cars to full or nearly full. Let's go see how it works. At the moment, there are less than a handful of other stations around Australia, but this one is important, not only because it sits between the population centers of Melbourne and Sydney, but also because it's capable of filling both our cars to full. What do we mean by this? Well, this is one area where there's a bit of a learning curve. Hydrogen can be stored in these two cars at two pressure levels, 350 bar and 700 bar, which you'll need to get the full advertised range. In the case of the Nexo, this is 660 kilometers, and for the Mirai, it's 650, which are big numbers compared to normal electric cars, and great news for Australians who like to travel long distances. It's a bit like what we love about diesel cars now. Hyundai has actually managed to travel a record distance of 887.5 kilometers on a single tank in the Nexo, a distance which was just beaten by the Mirai, which recently scored a record run of 1,003 kilometers over in Europe. While there aren't many refueling stations right now, the refueling process is one of the key benefits of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. As you can see, topping up the tank is a similar experience to refueling with petrol or diesel now and takes about the same time. But as we discovered, there are some teething issues. Because the hydrogen system is pressure based and this early station is a bit of a beta version, you can only fill up so many cars per day. In our experience, we were far from the first to use it and had to wait nearly an hour to top both cars up. Even then, we could only get each one to about two thirds full, leaving us with 480 kilometers of range in the Nexo and 470 in the Mirai. There was a sense of tension as we watched the grams tick up, as we were all hoping for enough range to get back to Sydney. Our test program takes us on an iconic Canberra and New South Wales journey, from the station here in Fishwick to the coastal holiday town of Batemans Bay, where we plan to return to Sydney via the coast. We were hoping to make it with roughly 50 kilometers to spare, although it's worth noting that with a single speed transmission, we expected our efficiency to drop on the open road. Will our fuel cell cars behave just like normal electric cars though? Stay tuned. First though, we're gonna leave you with some impressions of each car. It's not that different from a battery electric vehicle, and that's because the drive components are the same. You have a single motor with a single speed transmission, and basically it's accelerator to go, regen braking to slow down, and you've got the brake pads as your backup there. Interestingly though, the regen braking is quite aggressive, particularly in this Hyundai here, while you only have a hybrid sized battery. And so what that means is while it's welcome that you can regen a bit of energy, you can't really make the most of it in the same way a battery electric vehicle can. So let's talk about the Nexo a little bit. Well, here in the Nexo, things are really quite good. It's quiet in the cabin. It's got a nice soft ride as opposed to the Tucson, which is a little bit sportier and harsher, even though it's the same kind of size and shape as this car here. The steering as well is nice and light, and the performance is quite good, same as it is in the Kona Electric, and that's because it has essentially the same motor as the Kona Electric. Hyundai said it takes a lot of work to do sound deadening in the cabin. They have to think about things like acoustic glass because there's no other noise generated. Any noise from the outside of the car is the same cool sci-fi noise that the electric range of Hyundai vehicles generates, but that's about it really. 
even under acceleration, there's not really any noise. It'll just sort of surge forward silently. But if you are behind a hydrogen car in traffic, you'll see it intermittently spit out a whole bunch of water. What else do we like about the Nexo? Well, the cabin's big and light and airy, and the steering's nice and light as well, making it a pretty easy car to drive all around. It's maybe not as much of a tourer as the Mirai, which has firmer suspension and a bit of a lower ride height, so it's a bit nicer to drive in the corners where this car and its soft suspension will tilt side to side a little bit. Overall, it still has a light, springy and comfortable feeling though, so it's a nice car to drive. It'll be interesting to see how we go on our efficiency test here. Since we've started, the numbers come down quite a bit from one point something, we're now down to less than one, but we'll see how we go later on. So what's it like behind the wheel of the Mirai? Well, it's quite a contrast. The Mirai is bigger, more luxurious, heavier. It's everything you'd expect it to feel like just from looking at it. All the inputs in the Mirai have a bit more heft and seriousness to them, whether it's the steering or the pedals or the way the car responds when you hit a few bumps. I think one of the most interesting things about the Mirai is it feels like a Lexus product. It's got these really nice finishes all inside it. It could easily be a Lexus ES or something. But it does have that serious attitude too. It doesn't quite feel as playful as the Nexo, if that makes sense. But it is a bit more serious when it comes to driving as well. It is a little bit more claustrophobic on the inside as well. I feel like despite its size, it feels really closed in, especially compared to the Nexo, which has a smaller footprint, but just feels light and airy. Towards the end of day one, and the Mirai is showing a little bit less range left than its Nexo rival here. The delta between how much distance we still have to travel and how much range is left in the tank is a bit closer to at around 80 kilometers. We'll see if that changes in day two. Now you might be wondering why hydrogen? Why use this to generate energy over other methods? Well, to look at why, you really do need to look at the bigger picture. You may have seen some things circulating the internet that decry the inefficiency of hydrogen compared to pure electric cars. And it's true, by the time the power gets to the wheels, the overall efficiency is not as good as a normal electric car. This is because it takes a lot of energy to compress and refrigerate hydrogen into a form that can be used by our cars, there's no getting around it. What hydrogen is able to do though is provide some answers to some awkward realities of the world's power supply. A huge amount of power currently generated goes to waste, regardless of whether it is renewable or not. The power stations still burn, the wind still blows and the sun still bears down, and we have no way of storing it. This is why we have peak times where energy is expensive and off peaks where energy is cheap. Hydrogen can go some way to fixing this by using existing energy generators for compression and storage, essentially capturing that otherwise wasted idle energy. This way, you can essentially think of this compressed, usable hydrogen as a type of battery, but one that can be used to store much more potential energy at a lower cost than the equivalent in normal battery cells. But one of the most important things when it comes to powering cars and trucks with hydrogen is the weight of the whole system. To get the same range as one of these cars in a battery vehicle, you would need several hundred kilos of batteries under the floor, but these hydrogen cars have a similar weight to a regular petrol car. This is because the hydrogen fuel cell stack is nearly equivalent in weight to an engine and transmission, while an energy buffer for regen braking is stored in a hybrid-sized lithium battery. Now, if you've followed the logic so far, this will mean you can carry around loads of stuff with an electric motor without also having to carry hundreds of kilos worth of batteries. In other words, hydrogen is the ultimate replacement for diesel, where battery electric vehicles are the ultimate replacement for petrol. On this test, we're exploring the long-range touring ability of each car, and while we'd love to test towing abilities too, neither car is able to be fitted with a tow kit in Australia just yet. While we were initially quite worried about the amount of range our car started with, the second half of our journey to Batemans Bay involved a long and steep downhill stretch to the coast. This is perfect for regen braking, and there was a long time where our cars reported little to no loss in range. However, interestingly, the Nexo quickly filled its tiny battery with its strong regen system, disabling it entirely and having to rely on old-fashioned disc brakes for much of the descent. Would this boost our range beyond our expectations? Stay tuned. Here we are at the beginning of day two. The events of day one were really interesting. We learned a lot about the hydrogen station and the kind of limitations that affect it. We also enjoyed our drive in these two cars. They were really smooth. They handled the road really well. And now the interesting part, here's how much range they have left 
here's what they say they're consuming, and here's how far we have to go. Will we make it? The numbers say yes. Let's find out. A large part of our run between Batemans Bay and Sydney is made up of single lane highway driving at around 80 kilometers per hour. Unlike day one, there's little opportunity for regen braking, so while the range shown is promising, if our hydrogen cars behave anything like electric ones, we were still expecting the cars to be close to empty by the time we got to Sydney. Before we set off though, it's probably worth taking a moment to appreciate the interiors and features of each car. The Nexo is surprisingly normal from the outside, and unless you knew what you were looking for, it could easily be any other mid-size SUV. Its science fiction grille design and integrated front lighting sets it a little apart from the crowd, but other than that, this is a car which looks ready for the showroom. Like other electrified Hyundais, the Nexo impresses with its lifted bridge console, in this case absolutely smattered with buttons. The design is familiar, yet futuristic, with a blue-tinged touch for the interior materials and lots of little detail elements. Specs-wise, the Nexo isn't bad either, featuring a 7-inch digital dashboard and 12.3-inch widescreen multimedia display, complete with wireless phone charging. Hyundai says a certain portion of the interior materials is even recycled, further boosting this car's environmental cred. The back seat in the Nexo is far more practical and family-ready than the one in the Mirai. There is genuinely room for five adults in the car, the boot is also large compared to the Mirai, and pretty much on par for the mid-size SUV segment. Overall then, the Nexo is normal, polished, clearly mass-produced. It makes sense that the brand has managed to sell over 10,000 of them globally so far. The Mirai, meanwhile, needs to be seen in the flesh to be believed. It's unconventionally a sedan in the era of SUVs, but its swoopy bodywork and huge wheels make a statement on the road. During our test, the Mirai was by far the head-turner of the two, with puzzled onlookers trying to figure out exactly what they were looking at. The other thing which is also clear from the design and build quality of the Mirai is not only is it a mass production ready vehicle quite like the Nexo, but it also feels special, luxurious, as though a premium Lexus badge wouldn't be out of place on its bodywork. The interior of the Mirai continues this premium look and feel, although it's quite a bit more conservative in terms of its look compared to the Nexo. It's plush, low and slick in the driver's seat, and you're closed in by a tall dash, blacked out interior design, an impressive array of screens consisting of an 8 inch digital dash and 12.3 inch multimedia screen. Although it's missing some of the storage and practicality of the Nexo, and there's no wireless charger for your phone. The back seat is much the same, plush and luxurious, but perhaps only for two passengers, as the centre seat is compromised by a raised floor needed to facilitate the Mirai's hydrogen fuel tanks which are located where a transmission would normally be. For the same reason, the boot in the Mirai is pretty small, although it's almost perfectly rectangular and was surprisingly practical nonetheless. Each of our cars here are even driven differently, with the Nexo driven by an electric motor on the front axle and the Mirai driven by one in the rear. Here are the output figures. It's fair to say both cars have standard power figures, but impressive torque figures. There was a good portion of the first half of day two where the range in each car fluctuated and left us unsure if we'd survive the whole distance to Sydney. Although for the entirety of the day, the remaining range in each car's dash never dipped below what we'd ultimately need. By halfway, each car's consumption had leveled out and it became clear that our chances were pretty good. We're about two thirds of the way now through our second day. And I think the most interesting thing is that the Nexo has gone down to a certain level and it's just sort of stayed there. And it's also giving us plenty of kilometers left to reach our destination. With only 88 kilometers to go and 233 Ks of range, we can be pretty confident that we're gonna make it. But there's still Mount Oosley Road, which is a long uphill stretch. We know that isn't good for electric motors. So hopefully it doesn't throw a spanner in the works. We just swapped out of the Nexo, and interestingly, the Mirai has managed to close the gap quite a bit compared to its Nexo rival. If the computer here is to be believed, that's because the Mirai is actually more efficient on the straight, even though it feels a bit heavier, but maybe it's down to its drag number, who knows? At this point in the trip, the delta between the distance we have to go and the range in the tank has expanded out to 150 kilometers, giving this car a surprising advantage. Again, we've still got Mount Oosley Road to go, and that's a big uphill stretch, no good for an electric motor, and it's really set to cripple our range. So we'll see what effect that has before the end. The last steep incline up Mount Oosley near Wollongong was the real stress test for these systems. 
Both cars initially nosedived in their range projections, but after clipping around 10 kilometers extra off the remaining range, both had again stabilized by the top with their ultimate consumption numbers untarnished. It was interesting to see the initially pessimistic Mirai gradually overtake the Nexo in terms of its dash reported consumption over this test, ultimately leveling out the range remaining in both cars. Well, we made it to Sydney, and as you can see, both cars survived the trip. But by how much? Well, here are the figures on the dash. We were surprised by how much each of these vehicles managed to exceed its original range expectation. This was a really interesting and informative test because no one has driven these cars on the route that we've taken over the last two days. With no opportunity to refuel in between, we honestly didn't know if we were going to make it or not. Perhaps the most interesting thing about this test was that the hydrogen fuel cell systems didn't behave as we expected. Due to the electric motors and single speed transmissions, we had expected the range to plateau or drop with extended freeway driving as they do in battery electric cars. But instead, our hydrogen pair gradually dropped in consumption and extended the projected range instead. This quite literally adds fuel to the idea that hydrogen will make a suitable replacement for diesel and is very good for Aussie travelers concerned about the range of battery electric cars. It really does give a legitimate alternative. While we weren't out to find a direct winner with this test, what's the point, you can't even buy either of these cars yet, we did find that each one had its own virtues. The Mirai is more like a luxury sedan with all of the benefits that comes with. It's better to drive on the road and it feels better as a bit of a long distance tourer. The Nexo on the other hand, that's more of an accomplished family car. It's more practical on the inside, it's a little bit easier to maneuver around in, but it wasn't as refined as the Mirai. So there's a bit of give or take either way. These cars aren't really in the same class apart from the fact that they drive using hydrogen. With the amount of range left in both of these cars, we think hydrogen makes a really promising alternative to battery electric vehicles for the future of motoring in Australia. What do you think? Would you rather have a hydrogen car or a battery electric one? And which of these two would you prefer? Let us know in the comments below. And before you go, remember to read the full written review over on carsguide.com.au to get into the details a bit more about these two cars. We also have individual launch reviews of both. And if you did enjoy this video, remember to hit like, subscribe, and the bell notification icon on YouTube to stay up to date with all of our latest content.